Our next speaker is currently the senior curator at the Bath Preservation Trust, and she has just celebrated 20 years of service with the Trust. As an architectural historian and an authority on William Beckford, she has delighted audiences in Bath and further afield for many years. There will be another opportunity to hear her on William Beckford on Monday here at the Bath Royal Literary and Scientific Institution at 7.30 on Beckford's art collection. Today, she's talking about William Beckford and the importance of his Gothic novel. Can we welcome Dr. Amy Frost? Um, good morning, everyone. I'm lovely to be here. Um, this morning, I am barely going to skim the surface um, of uh, Beckford's novel, Vatek, which is a, a, a complex work. Um, for a more kind of in-depth introduction, I highly recommend the Tom Kima introduction to the current Oxford World Classics edition of Vatek. Um, and to delve even deeper, um, I would recommend Laurent Chatel's work, William Beckford, The Elusive Orientalist. Um, but what I'm going to do is offer an insight into Vatek and its place in William Beckford's life and work. Um, and Beckford was, is as complex and challenging and compelling as the novel itself is. Um, as his acquaintance, uh, Madame de Stahl, wrote of him in an undated letter, Beckford is rich, oriental and uncivilised. The trappings of his ideas are gorgeous and solemn, and there is a certain vastness about his conceptions which bespeaks a mind that loveth solitude and only peers into the world on high holy day occasions. William Beckford was born into a family of position and political power made possible by extreme wealth. He was born in 1760. And that wealth comes from the profits of the exploitation of enslaved people on sugar plantations in Jamaica. And that wealth underpins all of Beckford's creative endeavors. That wealth provided a privilege that funded his scholarship, his travels, his collecting, and it therefore funded his ability to study and own works and manuscripts that are fundamental to the creation um, of this novel. It's therefore fitting that the protagonists of the novel are judged at the end in terms of their abuses, their carelessness, and their exploitation of others. Or as William Beckford writes it, for their power, their pride, and their crimes. So for many, Vatek is not a Gothic novel at all. Um, and for others, it is a truly Gothic novel. Um, it is at its heart, an Orientalist novel that as one writer wrote was got out of Orientalism by editors, critics, and, and readers. And the extent of its Orientalism was edited out through various editions, sometimes by Beckford himself, sometimes by others, and wasn't really fully seen in Beckford's own lifetime, um, particularly because of the removal of his extensive textual notes. And that was only rectified by later editions, but by then the damage was done. By then the book had already been Gothicized. So there is a myth behind all good uh, stories. Um, uh, there is a creation myth behind the origin of Vatek, and it's sort of appropriate um, as Vatek's author, Beckford is as you know, Chatel's work really kind of beautifully captures, um, no mere author, but rather a, a storyteller or a, a fabulist. Um, and that's where some of the kind of, um, the things that are perhaps lacking in some of Beckford's writing in terms of his skill or his style, uh, are kind of made up for in the stories that he's telling. And um, he's much more interested in the telling of that story than necessarily the art of being a writer. We'll come back to that later. So it is very easy on uh, first encountering Beckford 
Um, and particularly because a lot of people first encounter Beckford through this Fonthill Abbey, the, the Gothic revival um, uh, house that he built about half an hour away in, at Fonthill in Wiltshire. Um, it's very easy to uh, assume that this sort of monstrous Gothic revival creation was the inspiration for this Gothic question mark uh, novel of Vatek. Um, but the relationship between the factual building and the fictional story is not as clear cut as that. And it's certainly not as clear cut as, say, the relationship between Walpole's Otranto and the construction of, of Strawberry Hill in Twickenham. Um, also, the architecture of Vathek is, is not Gothic. Um, it is Islamic and it is Oriental. Um, and it's easy to place it as Gothic. Um, due to the construction of spaces within the novel that just ooze the terrible and the awful grandeur of the sublime that we, we've just heard about. But the inspiration for Vatek, as, as Beckford himself tells us, um, is not this house at Font Hill, beautifully captured by the artist uh, John Piper in this, this rendering, um, but actually this house at Font Hill. Font Hill House, the mansion that his father created um, between 1755 and 1765. Um, or more directly, it, it, uh, the, the, the genesis of Vatek is an event that occurred in this house um, in December of 1781 in Beckford's 21st year. Um, and what I should say is, is before this, Beckford from a very young age has had uh, a, an interest in all those things that we've just we've just heard about earlier, um, and particularly an interest in um, the kind of sensations that the natural world can evoke within human emotion, um, and a real interest in the supernatural, um, and, and an early young obsession with Goethe, um, and, and that's also has an interest because of Goethe himself being influenced by um, is Islamic and Orientalist ideas. Um, so uh, Beckford wrote in a letter to his cousin and his wife, Louisa Beckford, who he's also having a relationship with, um, about the preparations that were occurring for what he calls a mysterious something that is going to take place um, at Font Hill House. And Font Hill House becomes known um, within Beckford's lifetime as Font Hill's Splendens because of the splendid things it contains. Um, and these mysterious, uh, well, the mysterious something that's being prepared is that he has commissioned the set designer and romantic artist, Philip de Lauterberg, to um, adapt or enhance spaces within this vast mansion. So to give you an idea of, of scale, um, if you know Cryer Park here in Bath, Splendens is about two si uh, twice the size of, of Cryer Park. Um, central mansion in the middle with these ring wings radiating from it. Um, and in particular, on the ground floor, this large stone hall, um, what Beckford's father referred to as the Egyptian hall. Um, and within these rooms, through this hall, up into the upper floors, um, particularly the, 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 the hall on the first floor here, um, and then into all the corridor corridors and passages. De Lauterberg is putting in velvet wall hangings, draperies, there is incense burning there. You can hear a string quartet playing, but you never see them. It's like that it, the sound is kind of drifting in on, on the breeze. Um, for this party, it's, it's sort of a, a Christmas party. It's an unofficial 21st birthday party for Beckford that occurs in December of 1781, to which Beckford invites his particular friends, Louisa Beckford, who he's having this sort of slightly tempestuous on her side relationship, um, and also William Courtney, the future Earl of Devon, who Beckford is also in, in a relationship with. Um, and Beckford actually writes an account of this party in 1834 while he's living here in Bath, so 57 years after the event. And the account that he writes is the sort of haze of the memory of an older man looking back and absolutely romanticizing um, this, this event that took place. And his telling of the tale 
weaves it almost from the account of an actual event into this idea of almost myth. Um, so uh, he writes, the solid Egyptian hall looked as if hewn out of a living rock. The line of apartments and apparently endless passages extending from it on either side were all vaulted. An interminable staircase, which when you looked down it, appeared as deep as the well in the pyramid, and when you looked up, was lost in vapour, led to suites of stately apartments, gleaming with marble pavements as polished as glass. And it's the scale, it's the scale of this house, and it's the scale of the way he describes this party um, that is particularly important. Um, Alderman Beckford's mansion was vast, um, made vast because of the vast profits that, that he was receiving from transatlantic slavery. And the scale of it matches or evokes the scale of the key building that you encounter at the beginning of Batek, um, uh, Caliph Batek's palace at al Fareni, with five wings and five further connected palaces, all dedicated to the senses. And also the concluding building that we encounter at the end of the novel, the Halls of Iblis, um, places entirely created around pleasures and power. Um, and the way that this party is experienced by Beckford um, and his beautiful young friends, as he recalls them at the time, is particularly important. So he continues his description. I still feel warmed and irritated by the recollections of that strange necromantic light which de Lauterberg had thrown over what absolutely appeared a realm of fairy, or rather perhaps a demon temple deep beneath the earth, set apart for tremendous mysteries. The glowing haze investing every object, the mystic look, the vastness, the intricacy of this vaulted labyrinth occasioned so bewildering an effect that it became impossible for anyone to determine at that moment where he stood, where he had been, or to whither he was wandering. Such was the confusion, the perplexity, so many illuminated stories of infinitely varied apartments gave rise to. It was, in short, the realisation of romance in its most extravagant intensity. No wonder such scenery inspired the descriptions of the halls of Iblis I composed in Vatek immediately upon my return to town, thoroughly imbued with all that passed at Font Hill during this voluptuous festival. So this myth-making of the creation of the book is in this account. Also, in Beckford saying that it only took him three days and two nights to write, when actually it took about five months. Mm -hmm. um, but, but there are lots of myths in, uh, about Beckford, and most of them he makes up himself. Um, but that sense of scale is really important, and scale reflected in the entertainments, the pleasures and behaviour that we encounter in the novel. Um, and it's a scale of entertainment and pleasure and behaviour that only immense wealth can provide. An entitlement that Beckford assumed as his right, but also interestingly, interestingly punishes his protagonist for in the novel. And it's a level of wealth and entitled behaviour that the transatlantic slave trade was generating in, in the emerging merchant class, the, the, the nouveau riche and a level of wealth that Beckford could afford to collect on a similar scale. Um, and I'm going to separate his Orientalist collecting of decorative art, particularly East Asian ceramics, also made possible through colonialism, um, for another time, and actually for Monday night, as, Becky said, uh, as uh, Betty said, Monday night at 7.30, I hear. Um, uh, when these pictures would also feature, because we're actually sitting underneath paintings that Beckford's father commissioned for that great hall at Font Hill Splendors. So he's peering down at all. Um, I'm going to say, talking about that, but what I'm going to do is separate from it a, a key element of his collecting that this wealth made possible, and that was his collecting of Persian manuscripts, of Indian paintings, and in particular of Arabic manuscripts of the tales of the Arabian Nights. And he also had the wealth to give him an education um, that supported academic scholarship. 
in particular, he could read Arabic. So all, all of these things that are really building towards the Orientalism that, that, that infuses Batek. And his knowledge of manuscript sources is seen throughout the novel. Oriental manuscript sources, it, it runs throughout the storytelling. Um, but particularly in, in these extensive notes that Beckford writes alongside the text, which were edited out in lots of editions, Gothicized. Um, and also an acknowledgement by um, Samuel Henley um, in the uh, beginning of the first unauthorized publication of Batek in, in 1786. So Samuel Henley um, was uh, employed by Beckford. Uh, Beckford wrote Batek in French, um, and Henley's role was to translate it into English. Um, and after around two years, with lots and lots of Beckford not being ready to publish it, wanting to make changes, particularly working on what are known as the episodes of Batek, which is a whole other talk, um, uh, Henley got impatient. Um, and published it in English without Beckford's permission. Um, and that's this first publication. Um, and there is even a, a, an origin myth around this. So Henley himself publishes it as if it is, he has edited an original manuscript of the Arabian Nights. Um, and Beckford, who at this time is in exile in Europe, his relationship with William Courtney having been exposed to the public, um, uh, decides to very quickly bring out his own edition. So at the time, Beckford is in, in exile in Lausanne, um, in Switzerland, not long after actually his, his wife very tragically dies after the birth of their second child. Um, and he quickly brings out the Lausanne edition of 80, uh, 1786. It says seven on the title page. It wasn't, that was, that's wrong. It's, it was published in 86. Um, and he's not really happy with it. So this is in French. He's not really happy with it. So he then brings out in following year, 17 um, um, to 87, the Paris edition. Um, all of these are in French and all of these are Beckford um, uh, published. Uh, however, um, there were lots of then subsequent editions where Beckford is adding notes, taking notes away, changing it. Um, so there isn't really a definitive text for Batek. Um, and the 1815 Paris edition, which is the first illustrate with an illustration published by Beckford, was very much seen by him as, as the sort of uh, the definitive version in his eyes. And actually the 1816 English edition, um, authorized by Beckford, published by Beckford, is very much the authoritative text. Um, in English, and that's the one that all of the, uh, these Oxford World Classics are taken from. Um, and this publication period is really interesting. So by 1815, 1816, um, there was a kind of um, rejuvenated interest in Vatek as a novel. Um, and that interest was very much uh, encouraged by Byron and by Byron commenting on it or noting it um, when he published um, The Guy All. And uh, that then brings a kind of renewed interest in the, in the novel. Um, and it also goes hand in hand with the moving from, say, the popularist Orientalism of the late 18th century into what Edward Said would call the, the modern Orientalism that comes following Napoleon's invasion of Egypt. Um, and these sort of things kind of come together and it starts to be sort of seen as a, um, an Orientalist text, yeah. So, um, for those of you that have not read it, um, uh, Vatek is seen often as loosely autobiographical. Um, it is the tale of a caliph with unlimited wealth and power who trades his soul, exchanges um, uh, his self, uh, does a deal with um, uh, the, a, a guy or uh, the kind of Mephistopheles character, so it's a retelling of Faust in a way, um, in order to go on a journey to the walls of Iblis, um, Iblis being the Islamic um, Lucifer, and uh, in return he will have all the knowledge that exists at his disposal. So it's less about wealth and power, it's more about knowledge. And this tells you quite a lot about Beckford at 21. Doesn't need wealth and power, he's already got it. So 
it has uh, an intentional change in tone which takes you a couple of reads to notice, um, but right from the opening paragraph, um, that change in tone is, is there. So we are told, Batek, ninth caliph of the race of Abbasides, was the son of Matassam and the grandson of Haran al-Rashid. From an early accession to the throne and the talents he possessed to adorn it, his subjects were induced to expect that his reign would be long and happy. His figure was pleasing and majestic, but when he was angry, one of his eyes became so terrible that no person could bear to behold it, and the wretch upon whom it was fixed instantly fell backward and sometimes expired. For fear, however, of depopulating his dominions and making his palace desolate, he but rarely gave way to his anger. Um, there, uh, Batek has all the ingredients that, that we heard about earlier, you know, all the ingredients of Gothic. It has a power crazed protagonist. It has an idealized hero in the character of Gulkenrose, this um, very pure um, uh, young man. Um, it has a uh, kind of enforced purity in, you can kind of call her the heroine, um, Nurinia, um, who is a little bit braver than some women in Gothic novels, but equally at the kind of mercy of sexual predators. It has the grotesque guy or the man or rather monster, as Beckford referred to him. And it has the creation of architecture and landscape that is vast yet claustrophobic. And the architecture in the novel is where its Gothicness really comes through, especially in the last section of the book. And therefore, that's possibly why when you finish reading it, you think you have been reading a more, it's very crude, but a more stereotypically gothic novel than you actually have. Um, because the power of the world that he evokes or that he creates um, sort of overshadows some of its earlier Orientalism. Um, the architecture is Islamic. But the atmosphere created by the evocation of it, the feel of it, the sensations of it, is the sublime. So it's almost irrelevant what the style of architecture is. It's actually about the, the, the place, the space that the architecture creates. Um, and that's really summed up in my absolute favourite paragraph um, from this novel. What, what I probably should have said at the beginning is I'm primarily an architectural historian, so that's where you're getting a lot of buildings. Um, it, uh, so this is the point where, so Beckford has made this deal, Guy or he has sacrificed 50 young, beautiful boys. He has um, uh, done everything he can that's asked of him in order to go on this journey to the rules of the bliss. Um, uh, pursued by his slightly crazed mother, during which he is sort of almost given Norinia, this, this young woman. Um, and they are approaching the halls of Iblis at this point. And this paragraph is really when that final part of the book, the, the most sort of evocative in terms of the sublime part of the book, really starts. So death-like stillness reigned over the mountain and through the air, the moon dilated on a vast platform, the shades of lofty columns, which reached from the terrace almost to the clouds. The gloomy watchtowers, whose number could not be counted, were covered by no roof, and their capitals of an architecture unknown in the records of the earth, served as an asylum for the birds of night, which alarmed at the approach of such visitants, fled away croaking. And they go on and enter the halls of Iblis. Uh, later on, the Caliph and Nurinio beheld each other with amazement at finding themselves in a place which, though roofed with a vaulted ceiling, was so spacious and lofty that at first they took it for an immeasurable plain. But their eyes at length grown familiar to the grandeur of the surrounding objects, they extended their view to those at a distance and discovered rows of columns and arcades, which gradually diminished. So they terminated in a point radiant as the sun when he darts his last beams athwart the ocean. 
So Said tells us um, uh, that popular or the popular Orientalism of the late 18th century cannot be fully separated from the interest in the Gothic in, in the late 18th century. Um, and he places Beckford within that, um, uh, writing that Oriental splendor can be associated with Piranesi's prisons. And that's what you're seeing on the screen. Beckford was a, a big collector of the work of the architect Piranesi and this series of imaginary prisons, this architecture that, that Piranesi created. And Piranesi's prisons are absolutely about magnitude, about vastness, about the infinite, as is what we just heard, that description of the architecture of Gimbata. It is about endlessness. It is about deprivation or, or, or privation. Um, it is about all of those things that, 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 that conjure the sublime and all of those things that are, are taken advantage of by Beckford in his descriptions of what happens when Vatek, having reached his destination, having this incredible place set out in front of him, um, starts to realise that those who are occupying this place Oh, perhaps it is perhaps not the, the, the place that he had been sold. So they, they start to walk around inside the halls of Iblis um, and they see the other people that are there. Their eyes deep sunk in their sockets resembled those phosphoric meteors that glimmer by night in places of internment. Some stalked slowly on, absorbed in profound reverie, some shrieking with agony ran furiously about like tigers wounded with poisoned arrows, whilst others grinding their teeth in rage foamed a lot more frantic than the wildest maniac. They all avoided each other, and though surrounded by a multitude that no one could number, each wandered at random, unheedful of the rest, as if alone on a desert where no foot had trodden. And that idea of the prisons that Piranesi captures is perhaps the, 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 the best kind of physical vis visualization outside of the architecture that we ourselves create um, when reading these novels. Um, you know, these are faceless, nameless prisoners that are not chained up um, because there is no escape. They don't need to be chained up. They are roaming these halls, these endless pathways, these endless bridges and staircases with no glimmer of sunlight or daylight or the world outside. And these really kind of powerful images, um, and this is Beckford's storytelling in the novel, perhaps at its most dramatic. Um, and in particular, uh, links to the authorised illustration that Beckford commissions, the first illustration for Vatek, um, which is the frontispiece of the 1815 edition, where you see Vatek and Urania on their knees um, below the, the, the grandeur of Iblis with the, the Gaior kind of um, whispering in their ears. And next for the storyteller is, is where this is, is, is important, or as you know, Chatel sees him, the, 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 the fabulist. And Beckford would prefer to read these works aloud. Um, he's less interested, perhaps, in the actual writing than he is in the storytelling, although he will go on to offer very clear critiques of other people's writing later. And in that storytelling, what we have is that importance of the, the word, then the spoken word. So it's storytelling, it's oritating, it's the power of the word to create reactions, heighten emotional response um, in an audience. It's the origin of the sublime from the pseudo longinus, um, the idea of the, the power of the spoken word that then becomes the kind of written word as the sublime and the ideas of the sublime are further developed. Um, and really captured uh, by Beckford in, you know, possibly you know, what's the greatest part of the book in a way, which is almost at the end. So this is almost the last thing you read. 
And again, this is why that the kind of strength of these environments that he's creating um, have so much kind of power on us and, and thinking of it in a, in a kind of Gothic frame of mind is, is at this moment. So the moment that is depicted um, when the Caliph and, and Nurunia have, have essentially come to the realization that in return for admittance into this place, this version of hell, actually, um, uh, they have admittance, but their punishment is that their, uh, their, the punishment for what, it, what they did to get there, the crimes particularly that they um, uh, undertook in order to get there, um, is that their hearts will be forever tormented by flames. They will become just others of those roaming individual people in a sea of others, but that are entirely alone. So they went wandering on from chamber to chamber, hall to hall and gallery to gallery, all without bounds or limit, all distinguishable by the same lowering gloom, all adorned with the same awful grandeur, all traversed by persons in search of repose and consolation, but who sought them in vain, for everyone carried within him a heart tormented in flames. Shunned by these various sufferers who seemed by their looks to be upbraiding the partners of their guilt, they withdrew from them to wait in direful suspense, the moment which should render them to each other the like objects of terror. So one of the key things is, is Pont Hill did not inspire Vatek. Um, Vatek inspired Pont Hill. Um, the scale of it, the journeys through it. Um, it, in, it. Its inspiration is more in the ideas um, that the root of, of Beckford's exploration of scale, of, of vastness, and particularly his manipulation of the views and the journey of a visitor, albeit he didn't actually have many, um, that they experienced in this building. Mm. That's what these ideas in Vatek were inspiring. And for us modern readers, um, we can also respond with equal kind of terror um, uh, or shock and revulsion um, to the novel, um, because we have the, the knowledge um, of the source of Beckford's wealth, and we have the acknowledgement of the exploitation um, that resulted uh, in the kind of, well, the exploitation and the racism that, that his wealth um, was a result of. And his immersion in his imaginings of the East Indies, this Orientalism in, in the novel, is a distraction um, from the reality of his complicity in the colonizing of the West Indies. It's a book that includes careless sacrifice and murder of those held in servitude. It's a book that includes dehumanizing of black women depicted in the novel as crazed necromancers. And it's a book that includes the physical mutilation of black men made into eunuchs. It is a troubling and difficult novel to read with that knowledge. So that origin myth of the creation of Vatek um, is important, not just for the, the genesis of the novel, um, but because the creation of that myth is here in Bath. So written that recollection of the party um, in 1834, while Beckford is in Bath, and while Beckford is about to embark on the next phase of improving his collection and improving his tower, that the just under uh, 12,500 pounds of compensation from the abolition of slavery provided him. Here is Beckford's Tower uh, here in Bath, built between 1826 and 1827. And Cyrus Redding, Beckford's Bath biographer, um, recalls in his biography um, a discussion with Beckford where Redding on visiting the tower um, likens it to uh, a key piece of architecture um, in Vatek, and that is the Tower of Vatek that he builds at the very beginning of the novel. And Beckford replies that that isn't what he's doing. It's actually that he has such exceptional sight, even at his age, 
that he builds towers because he can fully appreciate the, the, the views that they present. His towers are about observation, which they absolutely are. Um, so he was not, in building the tower here in Bath, making the tower of Vatek a reality. And he actually draws around the same time, not like well, a year before he dies, actually, 1843, um, uh, in the presence of someone else, um, a sketch of what he thinks the tower in Vatek looks like. Um, and to give you a, a, a sense of, of scale, um, there are two human figures at the bottom and this vast um, tower. That idea of stepping into a space and looking up where it almost appears infinite because of the way that the architecture is created is, as you look up, very sublime space. Um, so, so he's not building the tower in Bath um, uh, as a, a realisation of the tower in, in Vatek, but the tower in Bath absolutely resonates with Beckford's personality and, and is a real insight into why he built towers. Um, and the, the tower in Vatek offers kind of almost evidence for that, that insight. So I've jumped around quite a lot in the book, so you're gonna have to read it to get the chronology. Mm -hmm. but, um, um, but this comes near the beginning. Um, uh, where Bexford is, he's sort of been instructed to build this tower um, as one of the things that will get him to the walls of Iblis. Um, and he's been building a certain stage during the day, and then Jeannie is, 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 is building it twice that much at night, as this sort of like uh, magical kind of way. And, and lots of people are dying during the process of the construction. His pride arrived at its height when, having ascended for the first time the 1,500 stairs of his tower, he cast his eyes below and beheld men not larger than pismires, mountains than shells, and cities than beehives. The idea which such an elevation inspired of his own grandeur completely bewildered him. He was almost ready to adore himself. Till lifting his eyes upward, he saw the stars high above him as they appeared when he stood on the surface of the earth. He consoled himself, however, for this intruding and unwelcome perception of his littleness with the thought of being great in the eyes of others and flattered himself that the light of his mind would extend beyond the reach of his sight and extort from the stars the decrees of his destiny. So the Tower of Vatek is about superiority over people. And yet when you look up, you are just as far away from the heavens as you were from the ground. So it is superiority over people, but inferiority in the face of the vastness of nature, the, the infiniteness of God or whatever your belief system is, um, or the the power of Iblis. And Beckford is building towers for that reason. He can be above everyone else, but he is still just a small part of the natural world that he is observing and the power of that natural world. The vastness, the magnitude, the infinite. It's very sublime. Um, and you can see why you can choose to see it as a Gothic novel. But I urge you to, to consider it as Orientalism that then the Gothic gets enhanced through other readers. Thank you, Amy. That was wonderfully enlightening, especially people who haven't actually gone through the experience of reading this. <laughs> but um, do we have any questions for uh, for Amy? For all of it. Mm -hmm. Right. 
I want to debate foreignness, you know, mm -hmm. uh, because was there a fear at the time of the strange, the unknown? No, um, I mean, that's, that's once we start getting into Orientalism, we get into a whole other kind of discussion as well about the kind of exoticizing of the other. Um, that there is another you know, part of, of that that discussion that's you know, equally as problematic. But um, um, no, I mean, for Beckford, in a way, there there is more comfort for him in this kind of this world um, that he sort of fully immerses himself in, but but through you know books and and writing, albeit primary sources rather than um you know through other people's tellings but um that that he feels somehow um safe within um and that comes from very a very young age so you know Beckford even before his exile um would escape large entertainments or his home um and escape into the landscape um and surround himself with nature and then write these incredibly, you know, fantastic um, letters about, you know, seeking comfort, seeking escape within nature. And then nymphs appear and dryads appear and the element of the supernatural kind of then emerges. So, so it's a kind of world that he's creating, that, that he inhabits. Um, and I think there's, there's a very clear, therefore, distancing from what the reality of his, his world was was that he was a social outcast, he was exiled from his own home for 10 years, and, and the real reality of, of you know, the source of, of his wealth from the, from the West Indies. So, yeah, it's very complicated and complex and, and um, uh, fascinating. Right, there's a question over there. Now, we might have to repeat your question, mm -hmm. but uh, try... Well, why in French? Well, um, so why in French? Um, there was a bit of a tradition, actually, of writing uh, in, in French, not just um, kind of literature writing, but, but letter writing in particular. So um, a, a, a lot of Beckford's letters are in French. Um, it was a sign of a privileged or, a, a, you know, an aristocratic education. So a lot of English aristocrats at the time wrote to each other in French. Um, it was a symbol of learning. Um, Beckford writes to his daughter in French. He writes to his son-in-law in French. Um, I think there's also an element of he felt it was a more expressive language. Um, I mean, he's fluent in about six languages, but um, um, yeah, I think it, it was the expression, or there was vocabulary within it that that, that achieved what he was trying to say, um, and that's why he's so displeased with the attempts to translate it into English um, and he's constantly wanting to tweak it and change it and um but but doesn't fully really translate it himself because he you know he it is a translation from the French it is not a new version written in English um and, and that's quite key I mean it's why it's, it's a very influential piece of French literature in France oh, right we've got two more yeah Ella, you've been able to uh, get some microphone. Try try your question, because if it's short like that, we can translate it. In reality, the Tower of Constable the collapsed. Yes. What impact shaped confidence in the construction? No, nothing shook Beckford's confidence. Uh, um, so he, he sold Fog Hill in 1822, and that's when he came to Bath. Um, and the tower at Fonthill Abbey collapsed in 1825, so he'd already disposed of it, of what he called in a letter this cursed um, um, sepulchre, um, and he couldn't wait to get rid of it. Um, but there's a really kind of interesting story, again, in one of these kind of myths of, of I think I've come up whether it's in Cyrus Redding or where he sort of says, oh, of course, you know, I knew it had fallen down because I, you know, went to the top of my tower in Bath one day and I could no longer see it. Um, but the top of the tower in Bath wasn't finished until 1827 and Fonthill fell down in 1825. So, um, I mean, you would have been able to see it. You can see Alfred's tower from, from the tower here in Bath at Sourhead. Um, but I think that's very much his sort of, like, imaginings of it. 
Um, he moves on. Um, I think he sort of draws a line under something and thinks, uh, that's it, I've done it better than anyone else is going to do, and what happens next is, isn't is me, while at the same time was probably devastated. But then it had fallen down about five times while he was trying to build it anyway. Um, but, but he was very, um, yeah, he sort of, uh, at heart, actually, he wasn't into Gothic architecture. <laughs> Um, um, so, you know, he, he did it better than anyone else and you know, kind of drew a line under it. Great. John, did you want to know? It's the story of the death bed confession of the man who dug very shallow. Uh, another myth. Yeah. Yeah. Another myth. Yeah, so there is a story that um, Beckford knew Fawn Hill was going to fall down because the master mason who'd been building it on his deathbed um, begged for uh, Beckford to be brought to him um, because he had a confession. I mean, Beckford left Bath for his bookseller or um, when at times he could afford to take a house in London, he would not have left Bath to go to the deathbed of a master mason. Um, and apparently the mason says, oh, you know, you've got to get out, foundations are deep enough and then like, um, much later it falls down. Um, uh, we actually did a geophysical survey of the remain, the, the site of Pont Hill, and the foundations for the tower are more than four metres deep, so they are more than adequate for holding up the tower. Um, no, it was just really badly built. Um, the, the top of it, Beckford wanted it built yesterday, so he, he employed teams of builders to work at night. So There's fantastic letters where he writes, you know, you should see it here at night. Um, there's hollers and yells like they're coming from, you know, the, the, the depths of hell. Um, it's brilliantly evocative. And then the next day he's like, they're making so much bloody noise I can't see. <laughs> um, so so it's, it's another kind of myth, but almost kind of mitigating the fact the top of the building wasn't made of stone um, and that it was built much too fast. Right. There was another question. Yeah. 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 You mentioned the source of the world, mm -hmm. and when you were talking about rumours and, and then the dungeons, all mm those, -hmm. do you think it was rather by the source of the world? No, absolutely not. It wasn't playing on his mind. No, I, I, we used to. We used to sort of try and give him slightly more kind of um, benefit of the doubt than he deserves in that, you know, he was quite liberal and had his wealth come from another place, you know, would he have been pro-abolition? No, I mean, he's too selfish and he's too, and actually I have very, very recently um, read some letters which unequivocally make his opinion of abolition very, very. So um, he never went to Jamaica, unlike his father, he went you know, back and forward. So there is also that distance there in, in, in that he can kind of block out the reality. I mean, he absolutely would have been aware of, of the exploitation of, of enslaved Africans, of the treatment that, that was imposed on him. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, he, he I don't think it kept him awake at night because it meant that he could spend all this money on the things that he liked. Um, that's why, you know, we don't like him. I don't like him, he's not, he can't help be kind of fascinated by him. Okay, well, we'll uh, draw this to a conclusion and uh, give me thank Amy one more time. Another short break and then we'll have a third speaker on the hour. Thank you.